Amen. If you would, take your Bible and turn with me to Revelations in chapter 2. Book of Revelations in chapter 2. I know that uh, you were blessed last week by a message from Brother Joe Bagwell. As a matter of fact, we watched it at the lake last week. And it was a good message. I, I appreciate the compliments that he gave me. It was very humbling. And I was glad to see some of the back of your heads uh, here last week. The camera's back there, Jason, so... Uh, Smile, Ruby. Revelations in chapter 2. A week before last, we covered the coronavirus church at Smyrna. Uh, we're going to continue with the coronavirus church. Uh, we're going to continue on in, in chapter 2. In verse, we're going to begin in verse 12 with the coronavirus church at Pergamos. Now, what do we know about Pergamos? We know that uh, the ruins of Pergamos still stand today. Uh, we know that uh, somewhere in Acts in chapter 16, we see where Paul passed through this area on his second missionary journey. We don't know if he was the one that planted that church. Many believe that, that it would be some who would be disciples of Paul who would come and plant the church at Pergamos. We also know that Pergamos was a very uh, paganistic uh, area. Somewhere around 29 A.D., about the time that Jesus' ministry began, they even built a shrine or a temple to Caesar. There were, there were many temples in Pergamos. One of them was the temple of Caesar. Uh, we know also that uh, in Pergamos there was another temple, uh, and I can't pronounce the name. I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? I'll spell it out for you if you want me to. But there was a temple there to a god which was they, the, the pagans worshipped as the god of healing. Uh, it said that in this temple that they literally would turn snakes loose, non-venomous snakes, a certain type of non-venomous snakes, that many people who were ill or who uh, needed healing, that many of them would sleep in the temple. And if a snake crawled across their body at night, I know it kind of gives me the willies too, then supposedly these these snakes or this god would give them a dream or a vision and they would go to the priest and, and tell the priest what the dream was. The priest would tell him what to do in order to have a healing. Now, excuse me, from the temple, from the passage in Revelations in chapter 2, we learn also that there was a, a, New, Te <coughs> excuse me, a New Testament church there. Many have called the church at Pergamos the compromising church. And we're going to see this in just a moment as we read the passage beginning in verse 12. It says this, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, and even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give eat of the hidden manna, and I will give, a white, give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. I want you to notice this, first of all, in verse 12, it speaks to the church at Pergamos, but the one speaking is the one who has the two-edged sword. We know that this is a reference directly of Jesus Christ, that he is the one that holds the two-edged sword, that he, ultimately, we know in Hebrews, it, it describes the word of God as a sharp sword that's able to cut to the very asunder of the bone of the matter. As Jesus is addressing the church at Pergamos, he writes unto the angel, many suppose that this was uh, the pastor of the church. And we learn that uh, there, he names one in particular, that of Antipas. And Antipas was a martyr. Many believe that Antipas was perhaps the pastor of the church. But history tells us that Caius 
was the first pastor of the church at Pergamos. Now, I know that's a lot of invaluable information that you really could care a lot less about. But what we find in the church at Pergamos, and I shared with you as we began this series, that they were all going to have the three same main points that we were going to look at. And the first one is this. We were going to look at what they had. We learned that they had a strong faith. They had a strong faith. As a matter of fact, we learned of this Antipas that he actually died a martyr for the faith. And if you notice this, in verse 13, it names Antipas as my witness, my martyr, my faithful one, or my faithful. I want you to notice, this tells us that there were some in the church at Pergamos that were faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, even unto death. There were those who were willing to die for their faith. It appears that in the second century that there were several in this place that would suffer martyrdom. Carpus, Papulus, a woman named Agonathus, Atalus. Later on in the fifth century, we learn that there was a bishop in Pergamos in the Council of Ephesus in the 6th century. And there was one in the 5th, Synod at Constantinople. In the 7th century, Theodorus, bishop of the church there. In the 6th Synod, he had the same place. In the 8th century, one, one Pastelus, who was a bishop of Pergamos. In the same age, Basil, Bishop, this, bishop of this place. So we learned that there were several people throughout the history of the church at Pergamos that died for their faith or were martyred for the, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Keep in mind that this was a very paganistic society. They even had a throne to the, to the Greek god of Zeus. It's said today that the platform where Zeus's throne sat is still visible to the human eye. So what was taking place in Pergamos caused many Christians in the first century all the way up to the sixth century to literally die for their faith. Think about this for a moment, folks. We're living in unstable times right now. We're living in, in, in a time in which we don't know what's going to happen on tomorrow. James says... He asked us, why do we plan and we say that we're going to do this or that tomorrow? He said, for what is your life? It is even a vapor for which appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. Pergamos is much like the New Testament church of today. There are many in the church, perhaps, who would die for their faith. We also learned that our church, the New Testament church, is planning in a very pagan society, a, a, a place in which... The world has infiltrated the church and in many cases has overpowered the gospel. So I ask you today, in your faith, would you be willing to die for Christ? And you be careful when you answer that. We also learned that in the church at Pergamos that there was a compromising spirit. There's a mention of Balaam, the prostitute prophet. If you remember the story, you can read back in Numbers in chapter 22, all the way through about chapter 25, the story of Balak, the, the messenger of the king of Moab who was sent to Balaam, the prophet of Israel, in an attempt to get Israel, ultimately to defeat Israel, to overcome Israel, that the Moabites might rule over them or destroy them. And so the king of Moab sent Balak to Balaam, the prostitute priest, who was there, and keep this in mind, he was there to instruct the children of Israel in the ways of God. But Balaam was the type of person that would sell out to the highest bidder. So when Balak came and offered him, he, he tried to buy him, and he told him, Asked him if he would to place a curse on the nation of Israel. 
Mo, king of Moab thought that Balaam was so close to God that whatever he pronounced on the children of Israel would come about. When Balaam could not pronounce a curse upon the children of Israel, instead what he did is he went out and he grabbed the most beautiful Moabite women and he encouraged them to go in and to seduce the men of Israel that they might intermarry and that they might turn to pagan idol worship. And he succeeded. And he succeeded. Not only do we learn in verses 14, in, in verse 14 that there were people in the church who had allowed the world to infiltrate the church and ultimately to destroy the message of the gospel or the message of God. But there were, uh, as far as false doctrine, but there were also those within the church who were teaching people called Nicolaitans, who many early church fathers <coughs> said derived from Nicholas, who was one of the first deacons mentioned in chapter 6 of the, of the book of Acts. Where Balaam dealt with false doctrine, <coughs> the Nicolaitans promoted and taught a simple laxity in lifestyle. They believed that you could be a Christian, but you could also live the way you wanted to. That you could sexually indulge yourself to the point that it wasn't a sin. That sin did not necessarily abide in the body. And obviously from the passage in verse 15, we find that there was a failure to address. We're going to talk about this a little more in just a moment. <coughs> but what you have is you have these people in the New Testament church who believe these false things. And what Jesus is writing, or Jesus has spoken <coughs> to the church in, in Pergamos, he says, you're allowing it to happen. You're not dealing with it. You're allowing them to come into the church, to infiltrate the church and feel comfortable. You've strayed away from the true power and the message of the gospel. So this is what they had. Let's look at what they lacked. What they lacked was, first of all, the strength to deal with false doctrine. Once again, they allowed the world to creep in to the church. And the doctrine of Balaam had been teaching that the people of God <coughs> could intermarry with the heathen. And the, therefore they would become as the heathen were. So they failed to have the strength to deal with the issue of false doctrine and heresy in the church. Secondly, they lacked the fortitude to deal with false teachers and false teaching. Think about this for a moment, folks. There have been several different movements that have come through the New Testament church, all of which are anti-gospel. We've seen the prosperity gospel. We've seen... Uh, we've seen uh, all sorts of issues that have crept, about, crept in the doors of the church and the church has not spoken up according to the word of God and addressed it. Oh, because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Or because they're kin to a certain individual or a certain family in the church. We can't say anything to them. Hence, that's the reason that Baptist churches in particular, and I can speak to Baptist churches because I are one. I'm not a Baptist church. I'm a part of the Baptist church. That's why Baptist churches years ago got away from church discipline. Is because we didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Somebody told me this morning, said, Brother Joe, I'm offended at your time. It seems that we've raised a generation that's offended at everything. Or nothing. Now that, that was a joke. They, they, they weren't really offended at my time. But 
but many even within the church today believe that they can be one thing and another at the same time. Friend, the Bible makes it very clear that you're either saved or lost. That you're a child of God or a child of the devil. You can't have your cake and eat it too, as the old saying goes. That your name is either written down in the Lamb's Book of Life and that you will gain eternity in heaven or you're going to split the gates of hell wide open. And listen, hell is not a popular subject these days because it's offensive. I told, I've told several people this, but it seems as if our gener this generation that's coming up wants to destroy the history of our country. And listen, this is not a political sermon. But I've told several over the last several weeks, since all of these protests and the tearing down of statues and all that has happened, that people who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Listen, we can talk about the good old days. Sue told me the other day, she said, I think you and I were born in, in, the, wrong gener in the wrong decade or the wrong century. But you can talk about the good old days all you want to. We, we don't want to repeat slavery. We don't want to repeat that. We don't want to repeat civil wars. We, we don't want to repeat many of the mistakes that our forefathers made in the past. What we do want to repeat, what we do want to continue in, what we do want to see lived out in the life of every Christian is the Word of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed throughout the world. What we do want to see is more souls go to heaven and fewer souls go to hell. What we do want to see is the Lord Jesus Christ glorified. We don't glorify God when we allow the world to creep in and to overcome and to overpower what's true and what's scriptural and what's doctrinally sound. God is not glorified. The church today must stand for what's right and stand against what's wrong all at the same time. These were those things that the church at Pergamos lacked. So what did they need? What did they need? Well, one simple word that we find in verse 16. The word repent. And I want you to notice this. If you look at verse 16, it says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Some would look at this verse and say, well, You know what, preacher? That's kind of threatening. It is. It is. What Jesus tells the church at Pergamum is, If you don't deal with it, I will. If you don't deal with it, I will. You better repent. As I watched the video last week, I saw Brother Joe describing repent. And he, he walked this way and he said repentance is, is, is when you're walking this way and you turn completely and turn your back to what you were going towards. Repentance means turning away from sin and turning directly to God. Repentance means turning away from the world and following Jesus. Repentance means turning away from sin and turning toward heaven. That's how the Apostle Paul could say, I press towards the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul had repented of his sins and he turned to Christ. He admitted, though he admitted that he wasn't the perfect the perfect example of Christ when he was striving to get there. So friend, I want to ask you this morning, will history repeat itself? So we look at the church at Pergamos.
Friend, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to make one thing very, very clear. John in 14 and 6, Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through him. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried in a tomb. He was raised on the third day. For 40 days, he appeared to over 500 people. On the 40th day, he, he ascended into heaven as, as his disciples watched. The angels there standing with his disciples said, Why stay me here gazing? Put this in plain southern Arkansas English. He said, What you looking at? He's coming back. As we look towards the close of Revelation, John prays these simple words, Even so, come Lord Jesus. He may come today, He may come tomorrow, He may come next month, next year, or next century. Will you be prepared to meet Him? God speaking to your heart this morning, I want to encourage you to listen to his beck and call and to do what he commanded the church at Pergamos to do, to repent of your sins. The rest of the gospel is as you receive him as your Lord and Savior. He knows you by name. He knows the very hairs of your head. They're numbered. He's calling you today. Will you respond? Church, let me tell you something. The church at Pergamos has become in flux with the, with the world. That allow the world to come in and, and if you don't... I like to well from time to time. I'll go out to my shop. I've got a couple different types of welders. I've got a, a wire welder. I've got a stick welder. I prefer the stick. That's what I learned on many years ago when I was in the ag program at Ashton, Arkansas. I learned to stick weld. One of the things that I learned is that you needed to grab a rod that had flux on the outside. Flux coated the wire on the inside of the rod and it allowed the impurities that were in the metal to bowl to the top as the metal is fused together. But what the church, I'm afraid, has, has done over the years is we've scraped away the flux off of our rods and we've allowed the world to intermingle in our bond with Christ. And I know we look at that verse in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we say, well, God loves the world. Yes, He loved the world enough to send His Son to die on the cross. And we hear people say, well, you know, all we need now is love. We just need to love one another. What we need to do is love one another enough to share the whole gospel with them, the whole counsel of God. And the rest of that verse says, For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And believing in him means repenting of their sins. Making a complete opposite turnaround. And becoming a disciple, a follower of Christ. Leaving the past behind. We can't live for Jesus and live like the devil. Impossible. Impossible. Maybe there's something in your life that you need to practice what Pergamos was commanded to do. Repentance. Let's pray.
Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that it reveals. For the salvation that it, that it makes available. We thank you for the revelation of yourself that we find in it. For the path that's made straight. Lord, we pray that we would not repeat history. But Lord, we would look to the future of being in heaven with you for your name's sake and your glory as we continue to live on this earth. Let us be true. Let us be found faithful. Let us be named by your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Friend, if there's a decision here this morning that God is willing to make, I'm going to be available out on the front porch. I'd love to visit with you more about what it means to be a Christian. And to know that you can have eternal life. Brother Don, let's go ahead and stand together as we uh, sing our closing song. Uh, let's live our lives this week giving God all the glory.